I am delighted to welcome this eager crowd to uh, our first program in our series on Trump, the era of Trump, year one. This day, we're going to listen to uh, Professor Richard Painter of the University of Minnesota Law School. He'll be talking about the history of presidential ethics, a topic that is dear to all of our hearts, I think. Um, and I'd like to thank our sponsors for the program. That would be the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Minnesota, OLLI. We are so grateful for their co-sponsorship and Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, who sponsor financially underwrites these programs. We couldn't do it without them, and since that fund came into being, uh, by a vote of the voters of Minnesota to pass the Legacy Amendment in 2008. We thank all of you who made these programs possible. So thank you very much. <laughs> and I'll turn the podium over to Professor Painter at this point. Thank you very much, Judy. Thank you. Thrilled to be here. I've. Uh, Really enjoyed living in Minnesota for the past 10 years since I moved here in 2007 from my White House job. Uh, my family had not lived here in Minnesota um, here, before, but um, oh yeah, we're gonna. Can you do that? Tell you, it's a it's a wonderful place to be. The last person in my family lived here. My great great grandfather was a minister of the Plymouth Congregational Church and died here in 1884. But then I, I came back uh, in search of uh, uh, Minnesota nice ethics. <laughs> I put in two and a half years as a government ethics lawyer. Before that, I lived in Illinois. And actually, I grew up in Illinois as well. And then I went back uh, to teach at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Illinois is a great state, um, but we had a few governors who um, uh, served time. I. Uh, <laughs> I got there at age 10, I believe I remember moving to Illinois, there was a governor, Dan Walker, he eventually went to jail. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, we always said about Illinois that we, um, uh, you know, we had at one point, just a couple of years ago, a Democrat and a Republican governor who were serving their terms concurrently. <laughs> uh, and then Governor Ryan got out. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, every state has its issues. Uh, I won't even get into New Jersey politics. Uh, I practiced law in New York for a number of years. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, I've loved teaching at the University of Minnesota. Uh, the law school is just such a wonderful community. I uh, live in Mendota Heights now. Uh, and um, am uh, watching what's going on in Washington with increasing dismay. Uh, I have my finger in the pie a little bit still uh, as the uh, vice chair of a government reform organization called Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. Uh, and uh, I would be happy to discuss with you later on here some litigation that we have uh, uh, pending against certain uh, holders of high office. Uh, but um, I want to talk about the, the, the big themes that I dealt with when I was a government ethics lawyer in the, in the White House and uh, how I think that uh, some things are still the same and some things have uh, uh, gotten noticeably worse. Uh, I uh, was asked to be the ethics lawyer in the White House uh, back in 2005. Uh, I'm not sure what criteria they were looking for, but I believe they wanted a registered Republican to be in the Bush White House. I was a registered Republican in Illinois, I'm more of a moderate Republican. Now, I don't know what a moderate Republican is anymore because they, you know, they, they, they take a step to the right, call everyone a rhino, and then take another step to the right, and call everyone a rhino. Um, but anyway, I was a um, moderate Republican, registered as a Republican in Champaign County, Illinois. And um, so that was one thing they wanted for a White House ethics lawyer. I guess they wanted a lawyer, and I had that. Uh, I also taught ethics at the University of Illinois and business ethics, uh, lawyers' ethics, and I knew something about government ethics, uh, presumably. Uh, but I think what they were most interested in is someone who understood the ethics problems of uh, very rich people, uh, because that, that the, the large numbers of the uh, presidential appointees to senior positions uh, in uh, any administration, it was true of the Clinton, the Obama administration as well, 
Um, uh, not all of them, but a lot of them are uh, very wealthy individuals with significant financial holdings that present uh, conflict of interest problems. Now, back in the Bush days, we were dealing mostly with people in the, uh, you know, millionaires, $10 million, $100 million category. Uh, now, I guess you've got to be a billionaire to be a real player in this administration. Uh, so there's been some inflation in that regard. But um, what they wanted was someone who understood business and finance. And I have taught corporate and securities law and mergers and acquisitions and all that Wall Street type stuff for many years. Uh, so I uh, could sit down with someone like Hank Paulson, the uh, former head of Goldman Sachs, and explain to him what he needed to do to become Treasury Secretary. And I'm the one who had to break the bad news to him. He knew it already. He was smart enough to know it already, that he would have to sell all of his Goldman Sachs stock. Yes, all $600 million worth of Goldman Sachs stock. I, I felt bad for him. Um, <laughs> i would never been in this type of situation before, uh, but I, I could have empathy, I guess. Um, and uh, I explained to him very qu quickly that if you sold the Goldman Sachs stock to avoid conflicts of interest, because the ethics lawyer told you you had to, you could actually go to the Office of Government Ethics and get a letter, which is called a Certificate of Divestiture, which said, the ethics lawyer made me sell it. I didn't want to sell it, but he made me sell it. And then you give that to the IRS, and instead of paying your capital gains tax, you get a deferment of the capital gains tax. You just roll over the, the Goldman Sachs stock into something else. Uh, sort of the, uh, if you used to sell a house, so you could buy a new house and just roll over the old basis, and you don't pay the capital gains tax until you sell the whatever it is. So that saved uh, Hank uh, Paulson a good $50, $60 million. I think that made him feel better. Um, and, uh, you know, I have to say in retrospect, uh, you know, it wasn't that bad a deal to sell the Goldman stock in 2006. It's uh, better than selling it in 2008, for example. I, and uh, uh, so we went through this with a lot of people. Now, some people said they didn't want to, um, uh, to serve in the government if it required selling off their assets that created conflicts of interest. Uh, they might have um, a stock option still outstanding with their company they were CEO of, and uh, they couldn't exercise them yet. And I was telling them they'd have to walk away from those options and say, well, that's $150 billion or something. I said, well, yeah, but you've already got five or $600 billion. Do you really need the extra? Yes. Okay. Well, then, you know, we'll interview someone else for the job. And we always explained that, of course, everybody in the administration followed the same rule, including the President of the United States, uh, uh, George W. Bush. He, he had divested himself of a, of a baseball team, uh, as we might recall, and he did have that ranch down in Texas, uh, but um, he didn't have other uh, conflicting assets. We never considered opening up a hotel in his name or anything like that. Um, and he... Um, he, uh, he was following the same rule. Now, the actual law is that it is a criminal offense for any person in the executive branch of the United States government to participate in a government matter that has a direct and predictable uh, effect on their own financial interests or the financial interests of their spouse and certain other entities. That's a criminal offense. So the Treasury Secretary, if he owns Goldman Sachs stock, if he makes a decision, uh, participates in a matter that has a direct predictable effect on Goldman Sachs, that could be a felony, a violation of 18 United States Code 208. And uh, uh, yeah, the accommodations in, uh, in the club fed are not exactly like a Trump hotel. That's not where you want to go. So everybody understands those are the rules. Now, it is true that there are two executive branch officials who are not covered by this statute. Uh, and uh, nobody ever really talked about that because those two officials, the president and the vice president, uh, acted as if it did apply to them on the theory that it, it really doesn't look good to have the boss doing whatever he wants to do or she wants to do. Well, guess what? Everybody who's working for the boss would commit a crime, a felony, if they did the same thing. Uh, so we never really talked about that much, that this statute does not apply to the president. Now, President Trump says, well, gee, I didn't know about that, but this is actually pretty neat. The president can't have a conflict of interest. And so, well, no, that's not exactly right. 
uh, the president can have a conflict of interest. There are some legal provisions that apply to a conflict of interest that the president has, but this particular criminal statute that applies to everyone else in the executive branch does not apply to the president. Uh, it's just that other previous presidents have voluntarily avoided financial conflicts of interest and have conducted themselves in the same manner as everyone working for them. Uh, just as previous presidents, since Richard Nixon, have felt that every April 15 they should disclose their tax returns uh, to uh, the American people. Uh, so, for example, if they were to propose tax legislation that involves certain deductions and so forth, or benefits for real estate industry, whatever it is, you know, you would know what conflict of interest the president might have in proposing that legislation. Um, it's just there are certain norms that we've had across Democrat and Republican administrations, at least until recently. Um, so that was a large part of my job, dealing with people coming in uh, who were appointed to executive branch positions and, and cleaning out conflicts of interest, telling them what they had to sell in order to avoid the conflicts of interest. Uh, if we had a commerce secretary uh, come in, uh, we might, uh, well, I would tell him, you shouldn't own a financial interest in a shipping company. No, that's not a good idea. Now, the current uh, ethics staff at the Commerce Department, the White House, I guess, has a different view, but I think there are serious financial conflicts of interest uh, if the Commerce Secretary owns a piece of a shipping company uh, and uh, uh, then is asked to uh, discuss uh, trade. And once again, that criminal conflict of interest does, the statute does apply to the Commerce Secretary, so if he chooses to hold on to the shipping company, as Wilbur Ross has apparently done, he better be very, very careful uh, because that uh, could very well participate in a matter that has a direct and predictable effect on the shipping company could be a criminal offense. Now, you could say, well, you could always say, well, pardon me, Mr. President, but I don't think that's exactly the approach we want to have to ethics, uh, that people do whatever they want and then just go to the president uh, for a pardon. The reason I bring that up is I was very distressed about two weeks after the election when I uh, got on an NPR interview um, on the telephone and uh, was talking about conflicts of interest in these criminal statutes. And then they put Newt Gingrich on, the former Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, uh, uh, to argue with me about this. And he said, well, the President can just pardon anybody who does anything uh, that violates any of this stuff, uh, uh, this ethics stuff, or I guess anything else. Uh, that may technically be true, uh, but it's a type of uh, resolution uh, that I think would likely lead uh, to a constitutional crisis. We have rules uh, in the government, and the financial conflicts of interest rules are critically important uh, to the well-functioning of our government. And that was a large part of my job in, in the White House. Now, we also have rules when people leave the government. Uh, you may not lobby back to the government on the same particular party matter that you worked on when you were in the government. Now, if it's just a regulation or something like that, you can do it. But if it's a particular party matter, such as an investigation, you can't lobby back to the government trying to influence the government on behalf of other people on the same particular party matter you worked on when you were in the government. That's 18 United States Code 207. So, for example, just hypothetically, if there were an investigation going on into alleged collusion, it may well be fake news, but alleged collusion with Russia, uh, just hypothetically, and the FBI were to be conducting this investigation, and you were in the White House, and you were sitting down with the president to talk about whether to fire the FBI director in connection with this investigation or in some other way got involved personally and substantially in dealing with a White House response to this particular party matter, this investigation, uh, and then you left the White House and went and worked for, let's say, Breitbart News or some other place, um, it, 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 it might very well violate the statute, 18 United States code 207 to pick up the phone and try to influence the president or someone else at the White House, pressuring them maybe to 
fire the new guy, Robert Mueller, or whoever it is, uh, because this is the same particular party matter. You participated in personally and substantially when you were in the White House. Not a good idea, Mr. Bannon. Um, also, uh, if you're a senior employee of the White House, you actually have a one-year ban on lobbying back to the White House to change their mind on anything uh, if you're lobbying on behalf of other people. Now, for example, other people might be targets of the investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, not a good idea. So these are the revolving door out rules uh, with respect to lobbying back to the government. When can you do it? When can you not? I explain this to people in their exit interviews, telling White House staff we expected them to go and behave themselves because we don't want to have to visit them in jail. Once again, these are criminal statutes. Um, and then uh, we have the discussion of what do you do when there is a pending investigation. Um, well, uh, and I have to say the Bush administration had some difficulties in this area. Uh, most of the difficulties, of course, were before I got to the White House. Uh, and also, I want to uh, emphasize that I did not give advice. I was not allowed to give advice to the vice president's staff. Uh, or, uh, or anyone associated with the vice president, including Vice President Cheney. He had his own staff, including a chief of staff, Scooter Libby, who uh, believed that you know creative testimony in front of a grand jury was, well, maybe uh, what he was going to try. And it didn't work out so well, and he got hit with a perjury conviction. Well, when he was uh, uh, criminally charged, left the White House, uh, uh, President Bush asked me to give a briefing on ethics and also the handling of classified information. There was a dis uh, concern about abuse of cla classified information to so the entire White House staff. And so we brought people in in uh, groups of maybe about the size we have here, but we had the whole White House staff. So I think I gave about seven or eight of these lectures. And of course, uh, I didn't start off with it. No, you don't lie to a grand jury. That's pretty obvious. Uh, uh, but uh, we would discuss how do you handle an investigation? No comment. You do not comment on a pending investigation. The White House policies, you do not comment. The president does not comment on a, an investigation that's going on. I mean, can you imagine President Bush, President Clinton, and afterwards President Obama going out there and commenting? on an ongoing investigation by the Department of Justice or the FBI. No, the president doesn't do that. He doesn't tweet about it or all that kind of thing. Of course, we didn't have Twitter back in those days. Um, but, uh, uh, and nobody else should be commenting on an ongoing investigation. You also do not discuss an ongoing investigation uh, with the Justice Department. Why? Because someone's going to accuse you of obstructing justice. I mean, if you did something crazy, I'd call up the FBI director and say, come on, you know, I want to make sure you're being loyal to us or whatever. I mean, that's not a good idea because somebody's going to come along and accuse you of obstruction of justice, and we don't need that. We've been through this with President Nixon. Uh, I think the evidence that President Nixon was himself tied to the Watergate break-in is quite thin. Uh, but people working for him were tied to the Watergate break-in. And instead of just letting it alone and focusing on policy and other things, he, along with John Dean, who was, I've lectured in this in a number of panels with John Dean, who was just here in the Twin Cities a few weeks ago, uh, John Dean, his White House counsel, they got themselves in a big mess called Watergate, which got much worse because of the inability of President Nixon to just let it alone, let the investigation run its course. Whoever is responsible for the break-in at the Watergate, yep, they get in trouble, some other people get in trouble, some people may go to jail, but it wouldn't reach up to the president. And I'm convinced that he would have been just fine on that if he had let it run its course, which he did not. Now, of course, we're confronted with a little different type of investigation. Uh, I mean, I have said, well, Nixon, I, I was not a great fan of Richard Nixon. Even as a kid, I remember we go around, I was 10 years old, and we'd have these Nixon masks for Halloween. <laughs> Um, and I, I remember the Democrats would give us lots of candy and the Republicans were just a glare. Um, uh, that was back in 73, but it was, it was, it was getting bad. Um, but um, 
uh, you know, well, look, at least he was our croc. I mean, we didn't have the Russians do the Watergate break-in. Uh, it wasn't a KGB job. Uh, it was actually a really, really amateur job, I got to say. When you talk about breaking into the Democrat headquarters, and they didn't even know what they were doing. They couldn't get the masking tape on and figure it out right. Um, uh, you know, it's not like high-tech computer sleuths working for the, as a safer for the KGB or anything. But, uh, you know, so we have a somewhat similar situation, I think much more serious, today uh, because of the Russia involvement in break into the Democrat computers, um, much more serious from the national security vantage point. But the answer from the White House should be just let it alone. Let the FBI do their thing and figure out who was responsible and then if anyone colluded with the Russians and violated criminal law, we could talk about what criminal laws might apply or might not apply. Uh, just let the investigation run its course. But that doesn't seem to be the attitude uh, today. Um, uh, so we're, a number of things, I think, have changed significantly uh, under the Trump administration. But I can complain about President Trump ad nauseum. I'd be love to take your questions, have a discussion about my concerns with respect to this administration. But one thing I want to emphasize is that the uh, problem of corruption in government did not start with President Trump, will not end with President Trump, whenever that might be. Um, it, the problem of corruption in government is a large part of it is the revolving door in and out of government, people going from uh, uh, private companies or unions, whoever it is, into the government and then back out again. The revolving door problem, uh, but the biggest problem is campaign finance. It's the money and the politics uh, that has corrupted our system um, and it's something that everybody ought to worry about. I mean, liberals, conservatives, moderates, everybody ought to worry about a system where a tiny percentage of the people, uh, and a lot of them may not even be Americans, are uh, participating in um, uh, choosing the candidates. And the candidates develop a dependency relationship uh, on uh, concentrations of wealth that may be all over the world. And then uh, every November, we're asked to make a make a choice between uh, two party candidates, uh, uh, believing that uh, the, the, the candidates are beholden to the American people. And, and they're not going to be, if their ability to get reelected, their ability to keep their job, turns not on their appeal to the public as much as their appeal to financial backers, contributors to their campaigns, contributors to the organizations that run issue ads that really are backup for the campaigns. Um, and it's a serious problem. I spent a year away from Minnesota, out east of Harvard University, uh, uh, paid my salary here in Minnesota uh, to uh, write a book on uh, campaign finance and uh, why political conservatives should be as worried about campaign finance as liberals. Now, I'm I'd say more of a moderate Republican, but I would worked with a lot of people who are very conservative. And uh, I wrote this book called Taxation Only with Representation. The Conservative Conscience in Campaign Finance Reform. It's available on Amazon. It's published by Take Back Our Republic, a campaign finance reform group uh, that I'm a director of. And um, I wanted to get this rushed out into um, the press in January 2016. Uh, it's interesting. This, I published the book in January 2016, wrote most of it in 2015 on this grant from Harvard University. And uh, I don't know if I even mentioned Donald Trump. I thought, gee, that, by the time I get this book out, that, <laughs> We would have forgotten about him. Well, gee, am I wrong on that. Um, but I also had a, a different chapters of the book explaining why different categories of people who think of themselves as politically conservative should worry about campaign finance. So I had one chapter on the social conservatives and, and why they should, you know, they're going to get outvoted in just about every issue by the big money interests. Um, but then I had a chapter on uh, uh, people concerned about our national security. Uh, and our independence as a country. Uh, and I pointed out uh, that this was a concern of the founding fathers, that our country could be manipulated by foreign governments uh, and foreign interests with uh, very extreme concentrations of money. And they, they addressed this, and uh, they tried to address it. And one provision of the Constitution in particular, called the Emoluments Clause, I'll discuss this, that a little bit more here at the end of my presentation, um, 
uh, where they prohibited uh, a person holding a position of trust in the United States government from receiving uh, a, a presence or profits or benefits from foreign uh, governments. Uh, but the founders um, uh, were very worried about our politicians being beholden to foreign governments. That's what this emoluments clause is about. They didn't envision, of course, our system of campaign finance uh, evolving the way it did. Uh, but I start out this chapter in my book talking about how the founders worried about this problem, uh, the extreme concentrations of wealth uh, in the European, great European powers, Great Britain and France and Austria-Hungary, and there's a fourth one, uh, Russia. Oh, yeah, yeah, Russia, yeah. We'll talk more about them. But they, they've been playing this game for centuries of manipulating what goes on, in, usually in neighboring countries, uh, and getting involved in other countries' governments. Um, and uh, they didn't want any of that going on over here. Well, in this book, I, I, I shift focus very quickly to campaign finance. Uh, and um, uh, we now have a global economy uh, where there are many corporations are controlled overseas. Uh, our corporations, of course, uh, control subsidiaries overseas. But capitalism is global capitalism. Uh, and uh, so if we believe, as the Supreme Court of the United States says in the Citizens United opinion, that uh, uh, corporate wealth has free speech rights equivalent to individuals because corporations are persons, if we buy into that logic of the Supreme Court and Citizens United opinion, well, we just have to accept the reality that what this means is First Amendment rights uh, to influence elections, to create dependency relationships with politicians, First Amendment rights, free speech rights, supposedly, that will be vested in corporate interests that are not necessarily American, because capitalism is global, uh, and that's the world we live in. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is where I really try to needle some people in the uh, right end of the political spectrum, saying, well, you know, if you really want world government in the United States, this is the way to do it. Let's just keep on going uh, down the Citizens United path, and other countries will choose our government. Now, I mentioned Russia a little bit, but I was thinking of the extreme concentrations of wealth in China and the Middle East and other places, and the enormous potential influence that foreign governments could have on the United States through corporate campaign expenditures. Now, I never envisioned all the strategies uh, on Facebook and, and uh, Twitter and, uh, uh, you know, that, that the Kremlin apparently is well, well ahead of uh, many of us. Uh, but I envisioned a lot of what they could do to get money into the system, uh, corporate money. Uh, now, of course, it is illegal, say uh, my, those who contest this point. They say, it, well, it is illegal for foreign nationals to contribute money to American political campaigns. It's illegal. There's a law against it, and Citizens United does not give foreign governments or foreign nationals or foreign corporations those same free speech rights as the American corporations have. Indeed, the District of Columbia Circuit said exactly that. This does not extend to foreign companies. So it's still illegal. It is absolutely illegal for foreign nationals to contribute anything to American political campaigns. It's illegal in the state of Minnesota to drink under the age of 21, okay? Mm-hmm. Well, I think I figure out, uh, uh, and Vladimir Putin is a lot better than I am at this, uh, how to get money in American political campaigns, and it's a lot easier than it is to keg it, get a keg of beer in a freshman dormitory at the University of Minnesota. Uh, it, 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 this is a leaking sieve here uh, with respect to campaign money. And uh, the Supreme Court of the United States is not helping uh, through the Citizens United opinion. Um, campaign finance is a very challenging issue. Uh, I think we have a very good approach to it here in Minnesota uh, with the tax credit. Uh, so we get small dollar donors in. We need to get small dollar donors in and have our elected officials uh, at least have a chance to develop dependency relationships on ordinary Americans uh, who not only vote for them but would have the opportunity through the tax credit to contribute uh, $50 in Minnesota, but I was just going up to $200 on the federal level. And that was the theme of my book, Taxation Only with Representation. And I said, well, you know, the government shouldn't have a right to tax anybody at all. Now, my most conservative friends, they say, stop right there, that's fine. I um, said, no, unless that person has had an opportunity uh, to uh, designate the first $200 of his or her taxes to support a candidate 
uh, candidates of his or her choice in, in an election. Um, and that that'll be a fundamental right of a voter, of a citizen who's required to pay taxes. A meaningful voice gave to pick the political leaders who are gonna spend or waste or, or whatever they do with the rest or, or uh, give it to uh, uh, some uh, contract, uh, this, what is this, whitefish operating? Man, boy, man. And I, this is a point I made in that book. If you believe in fiscal conservatism and trying to have a budget that's balanced, and a small government, the last thing you would want would be a government that's dependent on campaign contributors because they're all going to be feeding at the trough for federal contracts. Um, and uh, so this is part of uh, the, uh, the message uh, that all Americans ought to be concerned about. Uh, and then on my book, I put a, a drawing on the front cover of, uh, I, of course, you've got to keep that Tea Party image, you know. So uh, they're heaving the, the crates of money off the, uh, off the boat there in Boston Harbor. Uh, that's the campaign money. We actually went and reenacted that at Boston Harbor about a year and a half ago. I went out there on tax day with Take Back Our Republic, and we had some big crates uh, with dollar signs on them, heaving them into the harbor, and we gave a few speeches. It was sort of fun. But... I don't think it had much impact. Um, <laughs> so anyway, now the last thing I'm going to address, I want to have a conversation here, uh, hear from you, is this a monuments clause of the Constitution? Nobody ever heard of that uh, until recently. Uh, well, I'd written about that in this book uh, because I traced the, the concern of the founding fathers about foreign influence, uh, but I was focusing more on campaign money in how foreign governments would uh, uh, get all this campaign money into the system. Uh, but I done write my research on the emoluments clause, and um, uh, so uh, when I heard uh, that actually the Republican Party was going to take uh, the nomination of Donald Trump for president seriously, um, uh, I'd done some things here in Minnesota to try to uh, try to avoid that uh, in the Republican caucuses, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, so. Um, uh, you know, I said, well, we could have a potential problem here. This is the summer of 2016, and I started talking to the newspapers about it. Uh, we could have a problem with this Trump business enterprise uh, because uh, they're doing an awful lot of deals all over the world, and they could have some sovereign wealth funds who have a piece of the action. And usually that is part of the deal when you do the business deals in the Middle East and some other places. And then also there's the question of bank financing. Um, it, I used to practice law in New York back in the late 80s, early 90s, and I'd worked with some real estate people, never did work with uh, the Trump Organization, uh, uh, but I knew lawyers who had represented Donald Trump, and I knew how real estate deals work, and uh, you use a lot of debt in real estate. You know, maybe 80, 90 percent of the value of the business is, uh, is debt capital. For example, the Trump Taj Mahal Casino down there in New Jersey, he had 90 percent debt he put in 10 cents on the dollar. Uh, the rest of it's bonds and banks. Um, and I watched those deals happen, and then I watched them unwind. And the banks didn't do so well. The bondholders did even worse, right? Yep, uh, the Taj Mahal, he never went bankrupt. The Taj Mahal went bankrupt. The corporation went bankrupt. The point is all that debt's at the corporate level. It's not personal debt of the person who owns the real estate business, and never is. You don't want to be personally liable for all this stuff. He put it down at the corporate level. The Taj Mahal, uh, Trump Casinos, Inc., or whatever it is, they borrow all the money. And then if it goes bust, it goes bust. That's the bondholder's problem. And there's a famous Third Circuit case on that. We've taught for 25 years in securities law. Third Circuit Court of Appeals said, well, you know, the bondholders should have known, known what they were getting into. They trusted them to get paid off, and now they're whining to the court. They, they should have known what they got into. And I said, yep, voters are the same way. Huh? But uh, uh, So we've gone through all that back in the 90s, uh, but then the question is who's loaning the money? Because the, the problem with the New York banks is they, um, they sort of like getting paid back, and if you don't pay them back, they don't loan you more. That's generally true with bankers. Um, 
And so the New York banks weren't, weren't shelling out a lot of money for the Trump organization. Well, who is? We had some of the same issues over at the Kushner operation. That was a little bit of a different problem because the old man had gotten a little jail time. Uh, some banks have a problem loaning to convicted felons, and so you had to have uh, uh, Jared go in there in front for his dad. He could get some money, but also there uh, a need uh, uh, to go to uh, maybe alternative sources of financing. We just simply don't know. We don't know where the money comes from. Uh, with respect to the Trump Organization, with respect to parts of the Kushner operation, uh, because it's privately held, and this is the way privately held companies work, it's private, it's nobody's business. Uh, if it's a public company like 3M, you can find all about their uh, stru uh, financing structure, where they're borrowing their money. Just look at their annual report, it's on the Securities Exchange Commission webpage. That's public information, but a private company is just that, it's private, it's nobody's business. Now, I would say I have an exception to that. If you become president of the United States, it should be people's business uh, because of financial conflicts of interest and because some of that money might be coming from sources uh, that create serious conflicts of interest and could indeed be unconstitutional. Now, uh, the money would be unconstitutional if it came from a foreign government or an entity controlled by a foreign government, such as a bank controlled by a foreign government. For example, the Bank of China. And we did find there's one mortgage, apparently they had a couple of hundred million in there at one point, um, and uh, it may have been on the Trump Tower. That's a problem, because the Monuments Clause of the Constitution says that a person holding a position of trust with the United States government shall not receive a present or an emolument from a foreign government. Now, present, we know what that is, right? It doesn't have to have a bow wrapped around it. It can be any old sweetheart deal, you know? Yeah, I can dress up any old deal to be a present, just give you more value than I'm taking. So uh, uh, that's the first thing, is a present from a foreign government or a foreign sovereign wealth fund or a bank controlled by a foreign government is unconstitutional for anyone holding a position of trust with the United States government. The second is an emolument. Now, what's that? That's a strange sounding word. Well, um, it has a Latin root, emolumentum. Uh, it means profit or benefit. Then the English word emolument was defined in Dr. Johnson, Samuel Johnson's 1755 dictionary as being a profit or benefit. Now, increasingly, the term was used in connection with profits and benefits received by people who hold a certain office and benefits and profits from that office, but is not limited to that, uh, certainly not in Dr. Johnson's dictionary. Uh, or in the original Latin meaning, and I don't think the founders intended it to be limited to payments received in connection with an office. It sounds an awful lot like bribes if there's a uh, the salary. Uh, now, the United States Department of Justice is currently taking the position, of course, that an emolument is only a payment in connection with an office. Uh, no, it is a profit or a benefit. Uh, that is a position uh, that uh, many of the uh, leading constitutional law scholars take and that I am taking in the current litigation in the Southern District of New York against President Trump over exactly this issue. Um, that the Constitution prohibits profits or benefits from foreign governments or entities controlled by foreign governments. For anyone, not just the President, anyone holding a position of trust in the United States government. And, and that makes sense. I mean, what's the point of having that uh, Boston Tea Party business and hauling haul all that tea and throwing it into Boston Harbor, making a big mess and having a revolution and everything, and then going to have a president of the United States is buying its own tea with King George. And that's not uh, what the founders anticipated. Now, they do have an out there. They say, without the consent of Congress. So the Emoluments Clause does allow Congress to give permission to take the emoluments, the profits or benefits from dealings with foreign countries. So, for example, President Trump could go to a Republican-controlled Congress and say, okay, I'd like my emoluments, I uh, can't be happy without my emoluments, and, uh, and so forth, and uh, uh, please give me permission. And then he could vote in permission. Now, there's a problem that I don't care how partisan they are and how much they don't want to offend him, at least until primary season, um, but uh, the last thing they're going to do is give a blank check on emoluments without finding out what's there. At least the smart ones aren't going to do that. 
uh, because they don't want to sign off on, uh, you know, say, well, Mr. President, you can do all the business you want with foreign countries and foreign governments uh, and entities controlled by foreign governments. And then along, you know, comes later on, there are a bunch of rubles sitting in there. That's not going to sit well with the voters. So the problem is the members of Congress would do what the founders anticipated, which is get the facts. And in this case, say, well, Mr. President, that's an excellent thing we're willing to consider. Show us um, tax returns, some other stuff. And, of course, he hasn't even attempted to go to Congress as the founders anticipated an office holder should and get permission to receive the profits and benefits from dealings with foreign countries. He has gone, gone ahead and done it. Now, the attitude of the Justice Department is... Well, first of all, a monument doesn't mean what everybody, most people say it means. Uh, it doesn't cover profiteering from dealings with foreign governments. And oh, and second, oh, organizations like Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, what's that? They have no business suing in federal court and we want them out. And that's what the Department of Justice has said. Uh, that is, of course, uh, paid for by uh, your tax dollars supporting the Department of Justice and litigating against us. Uh, so we have brought this suit against the president. Uh, there's a debate over whether we have standing in federal court. There's another lawsuit brought by the Attorney General of the State of Maryland, the Attorney General of the District of Columbia, and Maryland Federal District Court, alleging the same thing. Now, they have a little different standing argument. Uh, Attorney General of Maryland might have a pretty good one. This is a thing called the Constitution. It's a contract. States go into it. Maryland is one of the original signers of the Constitution, right? And it's a once you go in, you can't get out. It's like the Roach Motel, right? It's, we, we had that argument in the Civil War, right? Uh, well, if it's a deal, the state of Maryland goes in, uh, how about if the president or anyone else is not upholding their end of the bargain with respect to complying with the Constitution? So that litigation is pending in the federal court in Maryland. And another one is a whole bunch of members of Congress have sued saying, well, you should have come to us for permission and you never bothered to. And so they filed a lawsuit down in the uh, federal court in Washington, D.C. So we got three emoluments clause cases pending. Um, uh, we got a lot of action going on in Washington these days. I mean, it's amazing. We had some interesting developments yesterday. Um, and of course, the emoluments clause litigation is related, maybe, to what's going on with the Russian investigation. We just don't know. Uh, to what extent is there any Russian government money involved? We don't know. We aren't going to find out until with the judges in one of these cases decides that the parties bringing the suit have standing and then uh, ask for the information uh, in a process called discovery and takes a look at the finances of the Trump organization. Now, there is another body in our government that perhaps should be doing this. And actually, the Justice Department is arguing this, that this is Congress' responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, I actually agree it is Congress' responsibility. Where I disagree with the Justice Department, I don't think it's only Congress' responsibility. And if Congress wants to sit on their backside and do diddly squat, uh, or investigate the same uranium deal that we were investigating a couple of years ago, um, or investigate some, some missing emails from the State Department from 2012 or whatever. Um, you know, I don't know what they're doing in Congress, uh, but they aren't focusing on this issue uh, with respect to uh, foreign government money going to the United States government officials through profits and benefits. They don't want to investigate. And the last time I ran into Tom Emmer in the airport, he told me this whole Russia thing was a witch hunt. Uh, now, he's not my congressman, so I, I, I kind of boot him over that. Uh, I'm not getting any response from Jason Lewis, who is my congressman. I don't know what he's focusing on. Um, and then we got some other Congress people out there who may or may not be focusing. Um, and uh, I think they got a job to do, right? And I think it's everyone here, you're responsible to let them know they got a job to do, right? Get ready. They send them an email, uh, send them a tweet. Maybe that's the only way they respond these days uh, is through Twitter. Um, and then if that doesn't work, I guess you got to send them a message next year in November. But let's try and get them focusing now because Congress has work to do. It's called oversight. And it would be good for me, having worked in the Republican Party many years, to it'd be very good to see the Republican Party control of both houses of the United States uh, Congress and the White House and still conduct oversight to act like they ought to be and what the founders contemplated in the Constitution. Uh, Congress has an important oversight role. Uh, it's their job, and they need to do it. 
And a one-party rule doesn't work. Well, I guess there's an alternative. But it'd be, it'd be nice if this weren't a partisan issue. It shouldn't be a Democrat or Republican issue. Uh, foreign governments trying to influence our politicians. Uh, that's an American issue. Uh, but I've talked enough about everything I have to complain about. Uh, <laughs> well, some of what I have to complain about. I don't want to go into too much detail. I'd love to get some questions and discussion going with you. And I can bring the microphone around, so if you want to raise your hands, I'll... Okay, I'll start with this lady. Are you an actual Republican? <laughs> well, I... Uh, here in Minnesota, you don't register. You just show up at the caucus and sign something. You say you believe in the tenets of the Republican Party. And I took my 12-year-old uh, my son down to the Republican caucus in, uh, in Mendota Heights because, uh, well, I wanted to try to avert a disaster. Um, and uh, we did our part here in Minnesota, I guess. Um, so I signed the document. Of course, I, I always think about Abraham Lincoln and the history of the Republican Party there. I'm, I'm a moderate Republican. The Republican Party has changed enormously over the years. Um, and, and the same with the Democrat Party. Uh, and we can look at the history of that um, and how uh, large chunks of the country that were solid Democrat uh, came into the Republican Party and become quite solid Republican. Uh, look at the electoral map when Eisenhower won against Adlai Stevenson, which states went which way, versus, and then compare that to Bush v. Gore, and it's almost like uh, you flipped it around. Uh, uh, and uh, so the Republican Party has changed a lot. I'd like to see the Republican Party go back to its roots and focus on uh, a, a smaller, more efficient government, but keeping, uh, you know, running government like an efficient business, not a bankrupt business. Like an efficient business, keep the programs that Democrats have that work and make them work better, uh, and then uh, you know eliminate government programs that are wasteful, uh, solve our campaign finance problem, which uh, Teddy Roosevelt, good Republican president, he was one of the first to focus on it. And of all people, Barry Goldwater was adamant about campaign finance being corrupt. A lot of things I disagree with Barry Goldwater on, but on campaign finance, he was right on point. He was also right on point about the influence of the so-called religious right. Uh, we didn't have that business going on in the in the old Republican Party in the old days. They were all uh, uh, Democrats. William Jennings Bryan, Democrats. You want know, to study the history of the Scopes Monkey Trial there? And <laughs> William Jennings Bryan, the Democrats ran what four times for president, lost every time, and then he had to come back into the courtroom at an older age and stand up against the evils of teaching evolution in the schools. And, but that was a Democrat <laughs> problem. That wasn't our problem. So anyway, I'd like to, but you know something, I'm not going to walk. And I'll tell you why I'm not going to walk. We're not, we've got to have two very good, solid political parties in the United States. We're not going to have the Democrat Party and another one that gets taken over by Steve Bannon and the, uh, the nationalists. They're throwing a little socialism in with their nationalists. I don't want to even go anywhere near that. Those guys are dangerous, and they're not going to take over the Republican Party. This lady has a question. I, I, um, uh, this is going to sound cynical, but I actually had a, night, a nightmare about this the other night. And I think that actually it's a concern, uh, which is that um, I, I, probably a lot of people in the White House and associated with the White House are not going to be there very much longer. And given, well, we're, maybe, who, <laughs> depending on your point of view, but... Uh, who's going to replace them? There's going to be so many who are going to be gone. Yes. I mean, seriously. Yeah, there's <laughs> a lot of turnover in the White House. And, uh, and if we keep this up, there's going to be some turnover at the top. I mean, he's got to put away the Twitter. This, if he's just not comment on the Russia investigation, but every time he shoots his mouth off, he starts building up an obstruction of justice case against himself, the president. So I don't know where things are going to go. Uh, obviously, if the president leaves in midterm, we're going to end up with a vice president. And I know a lot of people in the left way of the political spectrum, but the moderates, a lot. I mean, look, I, Mike Pence is not my brand of Republican. I made it very clear he's not my brand of Republican. But I think we're, you're sort of wishing, you know, I mean, unless Bob Mueller knows something that I don't see reflect the public record, um, I think that you don't, I think Pence has kept himself away from the obstruction of justice enough uh, not to get charged with anything. Uh, and he's likely to be there. And so that's why I think there's some Democrats are saying, you know, they're not going to go through the effort of an impeachment or something like that, because what's their prize? They get Mike Pence. Uh, you know, whereas this situation is the Twitter account that just keeps on giving uh, from the Democrats' <laughs> perspective. So I don't know what's going to happen in this White House. 
But we need some responsible people. Now, some of them are better than others. I mean, Trump, he has some good people in there. Uh, you know, when General Kelly isn't mouthing off about Civil War history or picking on a congresswoman, I mean, he actually does sort of know how to run the place a little bit, at least enough to fire some of the races. Um, he's got a few more I've, I've asked him, he has suggested that he ought to fire, but uh, so there's some competent people there keeping this going. We've got a good, some good people in there. Uh, I mean, after all, the president controls the nuclear weapons, but I'm as worried about it as you are. This is, uh, this is a situation that appears to be out of control. And uh, the president on Twitter acting like a five-year-old isn't, isn't helping. It's not making me feel good when he controls the, the nuclear codes. There's a question here. Um, I appreciated you saying um, that uh, corruption has been in the past and it'll be in the future. And you explained what your position was um, at the White House. Um, I suspect there's no one in that position now, but I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, there is a lawyer who okay. is the White House ethics lawyer, um, and uh, 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 Pastano is his name. I mean, he hasn't done a lot other than write the Office of Government Ethics and write a letter. He wrote this letter to the Office of Government Ethics saying the ethics rules don't apply to the White House staff, which is not the position we took. Uh, that is just wrong. And then we had some other problems with respect to whether Wilbur Ross, not Wilbur Ross, well, he's another set of issues, but um, <laughs> Carl Icahn, uh, who, who ought to be able to freelance as a uh, advisor of the president without being a government employee and not subject to criminal conflict of interest statute. So that was a wrong call, and New Yorker wrote that one up, and the icon could be exposed to criminal charges on that. So, uh, yeah, they've got somebody in there, but they've been dropping the ball, that's for sure. This lady has a question. Would you talk a bit more about your moments case? Yeah, the Monuments case is uh, brought by Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington against Donald Trump, the president, in his official capacity, seeking an injunction, asking the court to look at what payments uh, the Trump organization is receiving from foreign governments or entities controlled by foreign governments, uh, and then uh, after the court finds out the facts, to enter an injunction telling the president which payments he can keep, which ones he can't keep. And then the idea is this will be run all the way up probably to the Supreme Court, and then the president would decide whether he's going to follow what the courts say or not. If he chooses not to, well, then he's likely to get booted. I mean, President Nixon even, you know, ultimately complied with an order of the Supreme Court to turn over the tapes. So the idea here is to get an injunction. Um, but the problem is that we need to have, show we have standing. We believe we do under the case law of the Second Circuit uh, to bring this uh, case. Uh, Judge Daniels of the Southern District of New York heard the case about 10 days ago, had a hearing. And it said he will give a, at least a preliminary ruling in the next month or two. So we'll see what happens on that. Meanwhile, though, every other, every issue in that case could be investigated, should be investigated by the United States House of Representatives and the Senate if they'd only get off their can and do it. But that's, so uh, that ought to be going on as well. How long has there been a, an ethics person appointed? And is that by law? Uh, the Office of Government Ethics uh, was established uh, a, um, uh, by the Ethics in Government Act uh, in the 1970s, and so they've had an Office of Government Ethics headed by a director as a five-year term appointed by the president, um, and uh, uh, th then each agency has its own ethics lawyer. I was the ethics lawyer for the White House. The White House has had a separate ethics lawyer since the um, end of the Reagan administration, beginning of the George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, the agencies have had their own ethics lawyers for longer than that. Uh, so a lot of changes came in in response to Watergate through the Ethics and Government Act. Uh, and uh, for a while, I think we thought things were getting better. And actually, President Obama put out an executive order that tightened things up on the revolving door in and out of Washington. Uh, we thought we were moving in the right direction until um, yeah, a little over a year ago. Professor, I'm 96. I've been a long time not Republican, very involved. What's your impression to the, to the observation of many, including me, that the South has taken over the party? Well, I think it's not. We should not just blame all this on the South because, um, and this is where Steve Bannon fits in. Uh, he is an expert at appealing uh, to the racial animosity uh, in, the, uh, in the Midwest and the North, uh, which has often been hidden, but it comes out 
uh, in rage, such as the 1970s busing, boy, uh, busing uh, uh, riots in Boston. I remember watching those on the television when I was a kid. So the, we've always been uh, willing to talk about racism in the South, um, and it was a serious problem, continues to be, but it's a problem throughout the country, and I think where Steve Bannon, the alt-right come in, is bringing out the northern racism, uh, and, uh, and also in part there are uh, the country closest to us. Now, that, that being said, I will say that there was a, a fundamental change in the um, Republican Party due to President Nixon's Southern strategy. Uh, and if you were to go back uh, 100 years, the majority party uh, has depended on a large block of votes in the South. Uh, and uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, being a premier example of that in the Democrat Party, who was able to get the White House after William James Bryan lost those four times. But Woodrow Wilson catered to some of those sentiments in the South. He had Southern roots himself. Uh, we know about that. President Franklin Roosevelt had to deal with it, and civil rights was certainly pushed to the back of the agenda. He had a lot more to deal with. President Truman started to contend with the issues. Uh, and then uh, uh, we had, under Kennedy and Johnson, of course, the South broke off. And uh, you had a split up, a breakup of the Democratic Party over that and the George Wallace third party movement. Nixon saw an opportunity, he swooped in. Um, and that helped turn the Republican Party into a majority party. But that does create a relationship, a dependency relationship with a lot of very powerful Southern politicians. And then Reagan solidified that by appealing to the religious right over issues such as abortion, uh, and that brought in a lot of people, and once again, up in that appeal more in the North and the Midwest as well. Uh, but it's created a fundamentally different Republican Party than the one that you were used to when you were younger, and even that I was used to when I was a kid. Uh, when, uh, you know, the, the position of the Republican Party on the abortion thing in 19, uh, right uh, under the Ford administration was either neutral, or the platform was neutral, and President Ford made it clear he pretty much agreed with the Supreme Court. Uh, I, I was very sad. I went to his funeral. I was in the Bush White House and went to his funeral outside the National Cathedral and had people holding signs there saying that President Ford was going to, you know, burn in hell or something like that because of his views on abortion. It was President Gerald R. Ford. And I went to his funeral to see these nutcakes standing outside the cathedral, uh, a church, uh, uh, saying these things at a man's funeral. Uh, they're the same people who show up at these funerals, I guess, around, they're doing it down in Kansas. But, um, uh, I thought, okay, they got a First Amendment right to say that, but that's not my kind of Republican. Yes, uh, Professor, I very much appreciate your remarks, and I have um, a two-part question about both your role as an ethics attorney in the White House as well as money and politics. One of the, the questions that I have uh, about the ethics issue is that it seems like the more ethics laws we have, hasn't really um, uh, done what it was intended to do, which is to increase the confidence and faith that the public has in elected officials and our government. In other words, we have a lot of uh, ethics laws, and yet the trust of government in government and elected officials mm -hmm. continues to deteriorate. And that causes me to be a little bit suspicious of, is that a, a route, a meaningful route, to increase the trust and confidence that we have in government. And with money and politics, I, I have a similar point or concern. We have numerous examples, both locally and nationally, where well-funded candidates have lost miserably. Um, money and politics doesn't, uh, really hasn't impacted the diffusion of opinions that we have. The internet has done much of that. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if we really constrain the money in politics, and I'd like to hear what your uh, uh, yeah. ideas are for that. Uh, uh, but those are two concerns that I have. I appreciate your comment. Well, money in politics is a hard one uh, to deal with. And what I suggest is, first of all, get small dollar donors in through the tax credits. At least get ordinary people into the financing business through tax credits, it's gonna actually save money in the budget in the long run because the politicians won't be dependent on the government contractors. Uh, uh, they'll at least have an opportunity to appeal to regular people for their $50 here in Minnesota, or I suggest a $200 tax credit at the national level. Uh, so get more small dollar donors in. Second, get as much transparency as you possibly can with respect to where the money's coming from. We could get a lot more. 
You ought to know where the money's coming from 501c4 organizations mm -hmm. that are running these ads. Those could be financed in the United States. It could be financed by the Kremlin, for all we know, because there's no transparency. Congress has refused to enact uh, laws that would require transparency, and that would not, I do not believe, would run into trouble at the United States Supreme Court. And then third, to the extent the Supreme Court will let you control what's going on with respect to the money, you do it. But we're up against the court on that one, uh, but that's only one of the many ways to do it. What I would not do is put all of the eggs in the third basket and just focus on trying to get rid of Citizens United, particularly through mm -hmm. constitutional amendment. I'm old enough to remember the ERA, Equal Rights Amendment, mm -hmm. for, for women. And uh, they, oh, well, that was a big fuss. People, of course, talk around about unisex bathrooms. But I remember this. I was in junior high or whatever at the time. Oh, gee, if we passed the ERA, we're going to have unisex bathrooms. They always want to bring up the, the bathrooms if they want to uh, <laughs> make a big issue. Uh, same old story. The point is, getting a constitutional amendment passed is almost impossible. It takes forever. And what do you get? You get rid of Citizens United. You get to go back to the wonderful world I had to live with under President Bush between McCain-Feingold when it was passed into law in 2001 and 2009 when the Supreme Court struck it, that, that portion of it down. I don't think that was so great. So uh, I wouldn't just focus on Citizens United and the Supreme Court. They haven't helped. They've made it a mess. Um, but we need to address campaign finance on all fronts. Um, I think the rules don't necessarily make things better, uh, but better off having some rules uh, and enforcing the rules we have, for example, the Monuments Clause of the Constitution uh, and other rules, and not having White House ethics lawyers or write letters to the Office of Government Ethics saying, well, the rules don't apply to the White House staff. Um, uh, we're better off uh, with some rules and enforcing the rules. What I want to warn people against is cynicism um, that gets so intense that people can't understand their different degrees of corruption. Uh, because this is what happened in the Weimar Republic. There was an enormous amount of corruption and dysfunction in the Weimar Republic in the 1920s uh, up to the elections of 1932-33. Uh, of uh, uh, but whatever they had was a lot better than whatever they got in 1933. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that if we become too cynical and we say, well, the government's all bought and so forth, everybody's corrupt. Uh, and uh, there are things I did not like about Hillary Clinton meeting with Goldman Sachs people. I, I had some problems with Hillary Clinton, I can assure you. But uh, we uh, say, well, everything's corrupt, and then the next thing people are screaming, lock her up. And that's the kind of rhetoric uh, where, uh, you know, the, you could be talking about the beginning of a dictatorship. So it's really, really important to recognize what's good about our system and what we ought to be proud of, and I felt we were making things better in some areas. Campaign finance was a mess. Um, uh, but we need to keep fighting for what's right and not, uh, not sort of tr this whole deconstruct everything. That's the Steve Bannon approach. And uh, you know what they want to put in this place. It is not what we want. Thank, yeah. Thank you very much for bringing the New York case, and I wish you the best of luck. My questions concern the Maryland case and the other case as well. What's the status of it, both time-wise and what are the chances there? Yeah, we were the first to file, so we had the hearing first. They have the hearings coming up. And uh, so you've got to get through the standing argument. The merits, the argument of merits is basically the same thing. But, you know, litigation of the court takes a while. As I say, you can get this on the rocket dock in the House Judiciary Committee if they just get off there, you know what. But uh, if they don't want to respond, then voters are going to have to kick them in the you-know-what. So the point is that the Congress could move very quickly to enforce the Monuments Clause of the Constitution. Uh, when we're trying to do it through the courts. We are at the mercy of the schedule of the courts, and uh, litigation takes a while. Maryland is not, has, has filed, but there's not been an oral argument on Maryland. Yeah, I think it's scheduled, I think, in about uh, six weeks, I believe. And then there's the third one brought by the members of Congress. There's a question back here. I've sat down and I can't get up, <laughs> but I, I want to know what are your thoughts, what does the Constitution say about having so many generals in high positions in government? Well, it doesn't say a lot about whether someone can be a general. Um, it's, you know, what it is clear is that we have civilian control of the military, not vice versa. And the, so the Secretary of Defense is appointed by the President, not chosen by the generals. And the generals report to the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Army, Navy, and Air Force. So we're supposed to clear in the Constitution civilian control of the military. Now, it doesn't mean that a general can't uh, go into 
of public service. We had a very good general become president of the United States, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Gee, if we could have that kind of Republican back in the driver's seat. Uh, uh, you know, he actually is smart. He knew a lot about what was going on, knew about that military industrial complex that was going to try and uh, uh, get the government spending way out of control. If you want to control government spending, that's one place you want to look. And he knew what that was all about. That's why he gave that speech just before John F. Kennedy came in. And part of that was a response to Kennedy's comments in the debates about the missile gap. And I mean, he was, what Ike was saying was, look, you know, just be careful. You don't just blow in a lot of money on, on, the, on the military hardware. And, and uh, because you're going to have this group of people in the companies, the military might want it. So the Constitution makes it clear that you have civilian control, but you could have generals become presidents. Some have been good presidents, some have somewhat lackluster presidents. Ulysses S. Grant was a lot better general than he was president. Um, he wasn't that great in the ethics front as president. Uh, but uh, uh, th that's what it's supposed to be. Now, what we got going on right now is you got a general chief of staff, a general in charge of the, uh, of the uh, Defense Department, um, and uh, a general in charge of the national security, uh, of McMaster. Um, I'm concerned about that. Now, if you ask, what, well, what's the alternative? The ge general is a lot better than the Bannonites. Uh, at least the generals seem to understand that racism is not a good thing, although General Kelly is sort of doing a little bit of, you know, dog whistling now, a, 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 little, a little distraction there. But, um, uh, you know, that uh, at least for a while there, uh, given the alternative, if it's generals who understand what's going on in the world versus, uh, you know, whoever these kooks are, uh, I'd rather have the generals. But that's not what the founders contemplated is strong civilian control of the military. And right now the civilian leaders in the White House are some of the weakest, the political operatives and so forth. There's a question back here. Is there any chance that Donald Trump's tax returns or the Trump Organization's source of money will be leaked? We do have a great legacy of leaks in this country. I don't know. It hasn't happened so far. Uh, the state of New York was considering a bill, however, it's an interesting bill up in Albany. They'd say, well, anyone who files a tax return in New York who uh, assumes a position uh, in the United States government that's voted on by people in the state of New York or the state of New York, such as the governor, um, president of the United States, if you file a New York tax return and you assume that position, they'll just post it on the website. That'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? I think they ought to do that in New York. Now, somebody that got that bottled up up at the assembly, to, uh, get things bottled up up at Albany is an old practice. Um, and there are various ways to do it. Uh, but uh, part of it may have been that some of the members of the, uh, of the state legislature in New York didn't want their tax returns up on the website. <laughs> uh, so uh, Trump's people were able to scare them off for the moment. But that would be a good way to do it. Um, so uh, we'll see what happens on that. This gentleman. I have a little different twist in er, change of subject. The current occupier of the White House makes a lot of pronouncements on uh, Twitter. I am confused because I would like to know how are these Twitter pronouncements are, what, how are they classified? Are they official presidential documents that will be archived? <laughs> or, or, uh, or are they just random brain blurts from him. Yeah. Well, they're pretty random. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I know. I think they'll end up getting our cut one way or the other. Uh, the president, uh, with the president, we don't have this uh, as sharp a distinction between personal capacity and a personal and political. He's also head of the Republican Party. Uh, which is not good news for the Republican Party right now. But um, uh, the, the tweets, we just got some more this morning. Uh, they're heavily personal. Um, and we're, we're learning much more about uh, the, uh, uh, the victims of, uh, of, of um, uh, lack of patriotism in NFL football games than we are about the victims of hurricanes uh, in Puerto Rico or Florida, Texas, or anywhere else. You know, it, it's amazing what's showing up on the Twitter page. Uh, I know the United States Football League uh, didn't do so well. I mean, New Jersey Generals fans out here? Oh, yeah, it was a great team. Mm, whatever. Um, but it didn't work out so well, so maybe as a beef about the uh, NFL. So there's a lot of personal stuff getting on the Twitter feed. Uh, that's the way he wants to be. Uh, he has a per he has a, there's another White House Twitter feed, but his one that he used as President of the United States, he's putting anything he feels like on there, and he can do that. 
Um, he could try to start World War III on Twitter, I guess. But at a certain point, I think that uh, Congress needs to step in because uh, we, you know, how much of this are we going to put up with? This gentleman. Uh, you mentioned a lot of litigation that's pending. Uh, could you tell us if that's civil or uh, uh, criminal? And do you have an idea how long it's going to be for all of that to be concluded? The emoluments clause litigation is civil, just asking for an injunction to be brought against the president to have a judge tell him what emoluments, what foreign government profits and benefits he can keep and what he can't keep. That's civil. Uh, there is criminal litigation pending uh, that is brought, a lot of it, by the special prosecutor, Robert Mueller, uh, who I don't think is going to get fired today. Uh, we're all worried about that. Uh, but. Uh, President Trump's own lawyer has apparently said that Robert Mueller has done nothing wrong. Um, so uh, we're, I think there's going to be some pushback on this foolishness um, from the lawyers, at least some of the lawyers. Uh, and uh, so Robert Mueller, the independent counsel, uh, will proceed, I think, with the criminal cases. Uh, so that's where a lot of the criminal cases are. And there are going to be some other criminal cases involving malfeasance in administration, just like we did under President Bush and some of the other presidents. Uh, brought by United States attorneys. Um, the Southern District of New York is one to keep an eye on. President Trump is, well, apparently he's personally interviewing candidates for the Southern District of New York prosecutor's job. We didn't do that under President Bush, but whatever. This lady has a question. Oh, oh that was my question uh, about him personally interviewing candidates for a uh, prosecutor. Yeah, well, he's president, so he's pointing them, so theoretically he can do it. But President Bush, uh, then he'd interview uh, candidates for Supreme Court. Uh, even judges, uh, other judgeships usually were decided by other people in the administration. Then President Bush would give them a call. Uh, same with United States attorneys. Uh, there's no rule against the President of the United States interviewing anybody he wants to appoint to a position, including the United States attorneys. What there is a law against is something called obstruction of justice. So, for example, if you were to say, well, if you become the United States Attorney in New York, uh, are you going to be loyal to me? Uh, well, that's sort of like asking your FBI director that question. That's not a good idea. Uh, so it all depends on what happens in those interviews, whether he crosses a legal boundary. A long time ago, uh, I think probably before your time, uh, there was a cartoon character known as Pogo, uh, who of the government said, uh, the problem is we, and by that I think he means not just us individually, but as a civilization and as a, uh, uh, a zeitgeist, the uh, t tenor of the time. What do you say to that? Well, I, I think that um, there's some truth to that. We're, we're, we're going through a difficult uh, time in, in our history. I think the economic growth has been slow uh, coming out of the 2008 uh, uh, debacle. Uh, but uh, uh, quite slow, and we continue to have a problem with respect to the distribution of wealth, um, and that's been going on for 30, 40 years, so you have a lot of resentment um, uh, about uh, uh, extreme concentrations of wealth, and it comes out with resentment over the campaign finance issue and other issues as well, and wage competition. So there's a lot of economic change, a lot of dislocation, um, and uh, people looking for a, a, a place to vent their anger. And the question is whether a concern about changes in the world are going to be put to a constructive, toward constructive uh, ends or destructive ends. Uh, and there's a lot we ought to be worried about with respect to change. I mean, the global warming problem and, and so forth. But um, if people are just angry, and looking for cheap solutions, uh, there are going to be people offering cheap solutions. And that's the danger. Um, so it, yes, it is a problem. But, it's a, but also, also a time we've had a, a dramatic reductions in global poverty. I mean, there's, some, there's made some progress in some areas as well. Um, uh, but uh, you know, this whole idea of trying to deconstruct the administrative state, I'm all for small government. But I just got an email from, I'm I still on President Trump's email list. I don't know why he doesn't take me off, but um, <laughs> he sent me an email, and I never gave him a nickel. He keeps asking for more. I never gave him five cents. He still wants, he wants to ask me for money. And he sent one out this morning about how, uh, oh, we're going to deconstruct the administrative state. And, and I mean, it's, it's crazy. Uh, we, we, you know, yes, we might want more efficient, smaller government and better government. 
uh, but this uh, uh, this idea that everything is going to heck in a handbasket and therefore we got to destroy the government and I mean I could just see Vladimir Putin with a great big smirk on his face when that kind of thing goes out. <laughs> Um, I have a kind of two-part question. Uh, is there any personal, legal, ethical responsibility on the part of the press secretary? Is the press secretary simply a mouthpiece, or is there a limit to knowingly misrepresenting the truth? And, and then, does the president have the unlimited authority to almost pre-pardon anybody he wishes to? Yeah, it's okay. Press secretaries. If if you could indict press secretaries for lying, we'd have a whole press secretaries wing of the federal penitentiary. <laughs> um, now I got to say that you know the longest services um, sentences might be being served by some of the current ones. Uh, it's gotten worse. Uh, but what was interesting to me is I used to be a lawyer for public companies and do securities law. And if you're a spokesperson for a public company and you you don't tell the truth, and people trade that company stock, you can get charged with securities fraud. And, uh, and I'd bring over securities lawyers into the White House Counsel's Office, and we look at what's going on in the press secretary's office, like, woo. Uh, you know, the press secretaries could shovel a lot of baloney. Uh, now, the question is, how much baloney? You know, where is our limit, uh, our tolerance limit? Uh, and it's, well, I just say it's been amazing, and it hasn't gotten better since uh, Spice. It's, uh, you know, I, I don't know where Huck, Huck Bay or Spice or, I don't know. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> I don't buy it, but you know, but it's a tone set at the top. I mean, the president's putting out tweets that are full of baloney. I mean, it, how many more times do I have to hear about crooked Hillary? Oh. I mean, I'm getting tired of hearing about crooked. I mean, it was it was uh, demeaning during the campaign to hear that, and now it's a year later. I'm still hearing about it. So yeah, they're gonna talk. There's nothing you can do about press secretaries who lie, um, except for they ought to be fired. Yeah, could you comment on the appointees for the heads of government agencies? Are there ethical rules that apply to them? I mean, leaving aside that most of them seem to be against the mission of the agencies that they're overseeing. Yeah, it's not a good idea to destroy the agency. That's not your, uh, your job. Uh, yeah, the financial conflict of interest rule is critically important. Uh, so the heads of agencies have that obligation. Uh, Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, he's got some investments. You've got to keep your eye on it. I think there's going to be some uh, shoes to drop on that one. He held on to stuff he shouldn't have held on to, I don't think. Uh, so uh, uh, financial conflicts of interest, number one. Uh, second, when they bring people into the agencies, they really ought to be careful about agency capture, where whatever, you know, let's say you're at the Environmental Protection Agency and the oil companies all want to come in and run the place. Well, that's not the function of the EPA, at least the last time I read the, read the statute. Um, but uh, the problem is the answer to a lot of this is political. You need to have oversight from Congress. Each agency has a committee of the House and a committee of the Senate that can call a hearing and ask them what's going on. You know, oversight, State Department, for example, they were very concerned about some missing emails. They weren't concerned about anything having to do with John Kerry, but they were interested and concerned about missing emails. That's, I guess, oversight. It could be abused, as you could see. But if Congress is doing its job, what they're really doing is focusing on the real issues at each agency. Uh, you know, are the energy companies trying to run the EPA and the Energy Department? Is Wall Street trying to run the Securities Exchange Commission? But if there's no congressional oversight, because they're all busy raising money, campaign money, and then the head of the agency is too busy getting their revolving door in and out of regulated industry. Well, that's what you get. That's what you get, yeah. Could you comment on the, the sort of pincer movement of Mueller's investigation? And if uh, Trump should get so aggravated that he does fire him, is there, enough, um, is, is there a mechanism within the Justice Department that the investigation that's being done by FBI agents can go forward and the prosecution could go forward without a, a special prosecutor? I think it probably would. Um, uh, how would, uh, uh, if Trump were to try to fire, President Trump were to try to fire Mueller, the way you'd have to do it the same way President Nixon did, he can't fire Mueller. He has to fire the Attorney General and replace the Attorney General with someone willing to engage in the firing of Miller, which I think would be obstruction of justice. So your first day on the job as Attorney General, you've got to commit a crime. Not a good idea. Now, Nixon did this, and he had to go through three. He went through Elliot Richardson, Ruckelshaus, and he got to Bob Bork, and Bob Bork was willing to do it and fire Archie Cox. 
Uh, so you could do that, but Trump has to find his Bob Bork. Um, and it doesn't work too well for you if you're going to go up for the Supreme Court later, yeah. as Bob Bork found out. Uh, so um, you got to find someone who wanted to do it. Now, some people talk about Rachel Brand. I know her. She was in the Justice Department. Now she's number three. Uh, and I put out a few tweets. I said, Rachel, don't even think about it. <laughs> um, so uh, that would be the strategy for him to mechanize. He could do a Saturday Night Massacre, but, it, it, but he'd have to find someone willing to do it. Second, I think Congress would flip out. And, uh, and, and start impeachment proceedings if he did that, probably. Yeah. At that point, I think the Republicans are going to say they're not going to go, they'd rather go into the 2018 elections with Mike Pence and get it over with than go in and irritate Trump's base than, uh, than, than put up with that. So you'd probably start impeachment proceedings. Third, the prosecution, what would happen? The Justice Department career lawyers would have an ethical obligation to continue their work. And a lot of career lawyers at the Justice Department know what's in Mueller's files. Uh, and then, furthermore, Mueller has been sharing information with the Attorney General of the State of New York, Mr. Schneiderman. Now, Mr. Schneiderman can only prosecute crimes under the laws of the State of New York. So some he might be able to prosecute, some others he might not be able to prosecute. But I'll bet he has a lot more than just that which he could prosecute. So that certainly would come into the public, uh, into the public arena, I would think, through uh, Mr. Schneiderman. So I think that Mueller is a very smart man. He's waiting for this day. <laughs> Trivia effect. Robert Mueller actually went to the same high school as Archibald Cox. <laughs> But let's just hope that is the only thing they have in common. I'd like you to play the prophet. If you were a historian 25 years out looking at this era, what would you be saying are the benefits that came from this period of time with everything you've been talking about? And what are the prices or the deficits that the country has paid because of the same historical context? Yeah, that's a hard question. One. Boy, 25 years out. Um, in a way, I, I think having gone through this with Donald Trump, uh, may have been uh, better for the country if we'd gone through whatever we would have got with someone like, for example, Ted Cruz. Because Ted Cruz, uh, you know, and I say maybe I speak as a moderate Republican, but they represent an sort of extremist view, but you know, of the, where our country ought to go. But there's some coherence to it. There's some coherence to Ted Cruz's view of where the country ought to go. To the extent there was authoritarianism, we would have gotten that out of a Cruz administration. It would have been a lot more controlled, a lot more disciplined. It wouldn't have been tweetable. Uh, and uh, what we've seen here is such blatant authoritarianism, destruction of norms, and so much in the open between, of course, President Trump, but also Bannon. Uh, you have this guy, Sebastian Gorka. Uh, hey, who is this guy? Dr. Gorka. Uh, that doctor, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, he, uh, well, he um, is an expert on terrorism, apparently, but he was basically, uh, President Trump liked him there because he gave good interviews on Fox News. Uh, and now he's over at Breitbart. He finally got fired. Uh, he brought old family medals from the uh, World War II era, I think the wrong side. Or, there's some debate about that, where those medals came from. But some Jewish organizations took offense, so did I. Um, and uh, so he's now over at Breitbart. And the other week, he said that Hillary Clinton ought to be executed for treason. I mean, I mean this is just ridiculous. I mean, who are these clowns? And they're working for the United States government. Uh, now, granted, he got fired finally after the Charlottesville thing, along with Manon. But these, uh, there's some crazies. But the thing is, there's such open uh, craziness that maybe it's better that we went through it this way than uh, it, with someone who would have more methodically uh, approached government. I think, you know, I, I think see some authoritarian trends. Um, I mean, both political parties at the, at the extreme elements. Um, but I think we'll get through it, and I think the Republican Party is going to have a fundamental. T either we're going to have a fundamental uh, change in direction, or we're going to break up. John Kasich is already talking about that. There's some, there's some noise being made about that. This lady has a question in the back here. I have an issue that's not traditionally defined as an ethics issue, but I think it's very unethical and has been brought to us by both parties. Both parties are are guilty. Um, and that is the abuse of redistricting power and gerrymandering. Oh, yeah. 
that's that's a uh, uh, you know you look at some of those districts uh, the way they're configured I mean, I mean, it's like abstract art like a Jackson Pollock painting uh, 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 you know they come up with these weird districts um, it is terrible impact on both political parties um, the worst impact is on the minority party because what it does to the minority party in that particular state I mean, it's happened more to the Democrats than the Republicans, but the minority party gets put into districts which are, in the case of the Democrats, extremely liberal. So you elect people who are extremely liberal to represent those districts, but who are not in touch with at least the way the state as a whole talks about issues. Now, remember, there's a big disjuncture between, you know, what's your position on the actual issue and the way you talk about it. But when you're talking to a very liberal <laughs> district about some issues, you can say things that do not appeal to the rest of the state. So what it means is not only if the Republicans are successful in gerrymandering a state, do they get most of the, uh, the seats in the state, but the Democrats will have an extremely weak bench for running for the United States Senate in that state because a few districts they have are very liberal and the, uh, represented by politicians who have been spending a good part of their time appealing to a liberal base without broadening their appeal. Uh, as this goes on, of course, those politicians, as much as they complain about uh, uh, gerrymandering, start to get dependent on it because they don't necessarily want to have a more moderate district so you wonder who really is opposed to gerrymandering and who is saying they're opposed to gerrymandering. It's a terrible problem. Uh, and it, the Supreme Court should not allow it. They should crack down on it. Terrible problem. Um, but it's caused great harm to both political parties and uh, has made a lot of people lose confidence in the government. Because in your, wherever you live, the congressman's got a, he's got a safe seat. Uh, 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 there is, there's an article about Pence in the New Yorker a couple of weeks ago and uh, how, according to the article, there are 16 of Koch brothers' um, men in the, in, the, in, in the administration now, and the Koch brothers have uh, a, an office in every state. What, what do you think uh, of the Koch brothers? Uh, po politics. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> not much. Um, I used to really be upset about the Koch brothers. I still am. I think the Mercer influence is even worse, and uh, they are not together. Uh, those are two different components. The Pro Koch brothers are more libertarian, I think, are skeptical of some of the authoritarian streaks, the Bannonism. Uh, there's a lot of Mercer money. Uh, Mercer's a hedge fund guy. Um, and uh, there's a lot of Mercer money in Breitbart News. Kellyanne Conway's got connections with the Mercers. So right now, the authoritarian streak of the Mercers makes me wish for the good old days of the excessively libertarian Koch brothers who just want to destroy the environment um, and cut the tax base to zero. You know, uh, But it's not a good situation when money influences politics. It's a very destructive situation. Um, and uh, maybe the, what we could hope for is that the Koch brothers uh, can go after the Mercers and really uh, they could just have a good, good old shootout there. Uh, and then on the Democrat side, I guess you got Soros and some others. Uh, but this is why the average American says, P.U., I don't want to have anything to do with this. I, I think we have time for just one more question in this uh, open space. And there's a gentleman here who wants to ask a question. But if Professor Painter has time and can stay a little longer, I know there are a lot of other hands up. If, if you're willing to I take... I can stay a little bit. I may have okay. to step out for about five minutes. The Canadian uh, TV wants to do this, a FaceTime type of thing. Oh, my. <laughs> uh, so I may just do that and then step right back on in. Look, but I go out in the parking lot. Here's our last question. I was wondering, do you think that uh, Bob Mueller has Trump's tax returns, or if is he going to get them? He's either got them or he's got similar information. In other words, you could just get the backup documents from the Trump organization, and I think he's getting that stuff. Now, he may be going a little slow because he knows every time he starts looking at the president's finances, the president starts rattling the cages about whether he ought to fire him and you know, yeah, that was a couple of weeks ago that Bob Mueller started looking at the Trump Organization finances and then the Attorney General was getting chewed out. And so, but he also knows he's getting warm on something. Uh, so he's, got, he's either got some of that or he's gonna get it. 
he's not going to finish this job without doing it. Well, we want to thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. I think you step outside for a minute. I'll come right back on in. And we hope, we hope to see everyone back next week for Professor Schultz. Thank you.